Good afternoon, everyone. I, I hope that we are already live. Uh, let me welcome all of you to the discussion about economic coercion and the best possible ways in which Europe could protect itself against it. The European Commission uh, is currently in the process of designing an anti-coercion instrument, which would allow Europe to take countermeasures against third country coercion and act as a deterrent against coercive practices. It is set to propose the instrument in the autumn and the co-legislators will then decide whether that, uh, they want such a deterrent or not. Today at ECFR, um, we have published a policy brief proposing concrete ways in which the deterrent, uh, we, in which the different uh, dilemmas uh, in such an instrument, such as concerning its scope or countermeasures or the decision-making process could be resolved in practice. And I'm very excited that we'll be able to discuss these uh, ideas with uh, Ms. Sabine Bayant, Director General at the uh, European Commission's Trade Department, DigiTrade, uh, with uh, Ms. Noël Lenoir, uh, French lawyer and politician, former Minister for European Affairs, and Mr. Carl Bildt, uh, ECFR's co-chair and former Prime Minister, as well as uh, Foreign Minister of Sweden. The panel also includes my colleague, Jonathan Hackenbrosch, uh, policy fellow at ECFR and author of uh, ECFR's policy brief published today. My name is Paweł Zerka. I'm policy fellow too at uh, ECFR and also a co-author of this paper. And I will have the privilege to moderate this uh, discussion. Uh, today's meeting is a public one, a recorded one. Uh, so uh, the audience uh, and everyone who is in the audience, please feel free to quote or to tweet um, about it. And without further ado, let me go directly to Jonathan and ask you if you could give us a brief summary of how the anti-coercion instrument could look like if Europeans chose to adopt it, and in what instances would Europe need to use it? Thank you, Pavel. Um, hello, everyone uh, on, on the line, and especially uh, hello to our three speakers. I'm very delighted to be to have you and and um, to be on a panel with you. I'll just show th two or three slides based on our report, um, Pavel and my, Pavel's and my report. Uh, on what this instrument could look like or what the key questions from our point of view are. And um, as always in these situations, one hopes it works, but it seems to work. So um, uh, first of all, what we do in the report is uh, consider the situation and, um, and analyze what, what is the situation uh, around economic coercion uh, for Europeans uh, at the moment. And um, we, we have three analytical con uh, main conclusions really uh, uh, we've all seen in recent months uh, that Russia uh, was considering, might still be considering uh, banning, banning Czech beer um, uh, as punishment for, for, um, for the Czech Republic declaring that it was um, uh, 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 Russia's military intelligence service um, uh, that was behind uh, uh, warehouse bombings in, in the, or warehouse explosions uh, in 2014. Um, we've also, uh, we're still very much aware of the Chinese sanctions in March that did also have economic, uh, involve economic punishment against European companies, uh, take H&M, Adidas and others that disappeared from e-commerce platforms and other, um, and, and face popular boycotts, which, um, which are an increasingly common Chinese sanctions tactic. And, um, and uh, we uh, also have seen that uh, uh, while the US administration has suspended um, certain sanctions on Nord Stream 2 and, and, um, uh, uh, and also Section 301 threats over the dig digital taxes. Um, even the new administration doesn't completely take these options off the table with regards to, to, to the EU and relations to the EU. So we have three main conclusions, as I said, um, on economic coercion. One is China is willing to use economic punishment to change EU policies and increasingly so. And that's important because the economic damage that came with the sanctions in March was fairly little when we look at H&M and Adidas disappearing from these platforms. But the message communicated behind it that we analyzed as ECFR, um, uh, uh, or the, uh, how we analyzed it was uh, very much um, uh, a message to Europeans, be careful about policy stances because we may use such methods of economic punishment. Second, 
it's not about any one actor because we see structural changes and how, how global trade is changing and how um, economic links are being weaponized and used for geopolitical advantage. And you have a, a whole uh, a range of, of countries rising and getting becoming ever more important relative to the G7 uh, that intertwine geopolitics and economics and state action and economics and trade uh, as if they were uh, part of one sphere. And third, um, economic coercion increasingly acts through uh, economic networks. Uh, and, um, and, and this means that you can alter de facto de facto alter European policies by targeting European companies, which are ever more, um, which ever more find themselves between a squeeze, between a rock and a hard place, between different regulations, a regulation that says you must not um, follow US sanctions or European sanctions in China, for instance. And, um, and that needs to be taken into account. So uh, we have looked at what an instrument can look like and identified four key political questions. Um, this instrument, as Pavel has said, and as the Commission is, is contemplating, would be for deterrence purposes and would involve um, the EU being able to use countermeasures, most likely. And, and, uh, and uh, in any case, that's how we analyzed it. And, um, and so the question really, the, main qu the first question you, you ask yourself, of course, is, so apart from what countermeasures, which is the second question, and I'll talk about that in just a second, the first question is what coercion are we, are we um, uh, responding uh, to under such an instrument of, of uh, an anti-coercion instrument? And that question for us um, on, on that was very, uh, it seemed very important based on the task force work that we've done together with high level representatives of governments and, and the private sector, which um, uh, this report is based on, even if it's not uh, consensus work or, or um, uh, even if it's um, Pavel's and my, my opinion. Um, our conclusion from that work was that we probably need something like a flexible resilience mechanism. Um, because if we base an, the anti-coercion instrument solely on, um, uh, on predefined triggers, and just predefine what sort of coercion, state against state coercion, um, we, uh, we mean, then it, it leaves open a gap. Um, and that gap in ad hoc cases, we believe that gap should be filled. Um, so if we can see, for example, great damage to European companies and sectors or critical European interests hurt, when the, the commission and member states agree, um, it should be possible to then also use the anti-coercion instrument and thus countermeasures against that coerce, that very specific coercive act. The question, what countermeasures? Um, here, we, we identified a, a big difficulty for the EU, which comes from this odd structure that is the EU, because of course, we're not the United States of Europe and we're not uh, going to be the United States of Europe uh, anytime soon, but we're also more than just individual nation states. And that makes it difficult to design the right countermeasures, which have to be effective on one hand, but also credible and effective, meaning they have to impress a third country and actually make a difference. And credible, meaning um, it has to be credible that the EU can, can impose them swiftly with the, the necessary level of member state ownership. And the last slide tackles exactly that question. So if we want to have countermeasures that are both a credible and effective, a theoretical example would be having an EU OFAC, uh, centralized competence, um, centralized enforcement, and therefore uh, very credible and effective because you can target the, the third country where, where it will be impressed or where it will make a difference and it's credible. That's unfeasible for the moment, but we're just mentioning it here as a, as a sort of mo model or, or an ideal type uh, scenario for countermeasures. The other countermeasures are either more effective than credible or more credible than effective, and it all depends on how they are used, of course, um, except regulatory countermeasures, which are in the middle, but they bring other difficulties, uh, not, most notably um, the, the politicization of regulatory decisions of what should be technical decisions maybe, and therefore they're difficult as well. So we're facing a big difficulty here as Europeans finding the right countermeasures. But what we've identified is especially that tariffs and trade curves that you can see at the bottom and investment restrictions are very credible and they may at times or often be effective, but 
note, note that um, uh, they may also not be effective. And that's why they're on the edge here, um, because one of the lessons of uh, certainly of Trump's maximum pressure campaign against China was, and we're not comparing Europe to, 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 to doing this at all, but one of the lessons that came, that came out of it was that Tariffs did probably not impress China very much, and that this uh, that the maximum pressure strategy was probably not very effective. Investment restrictions can be very very uh, effective, um, but incredible. Um, but we also mentioned something else: sectoral sanctions, sectoral divestment, and export controls. Um, why? Because of course we have a the decision making is not as easy on the European level, but we might have a very effective tool there because if we think about strategically what it is that a different country may not um, like to lose uh, it might be investments in certain critical sectors uh, that european investments that are still important be it for tech transfer interests or, or other reasons or access to certain highly specialized products that aren't um, uh, that that if that withholding them would not hurt the EU very much, but that uh, a third country cannot easily substitute or replace. That could be a highly effective countermeasure. And we've looked at how credible it can be. And I'll stop here and hand over to Pavel with some, some of these ideas. There are more key questions, of course, on this instrument, and we, we, um, we have most of them hopefully covered in the report. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. I think the, the question to, to the three other panelists is pretty straightforward. And this is whether this is the right answer to the right question, or to put it differently, to what extent economic coercion is a problem for Europe? And if it is, does Europe need a new tool to deter it on, or to respond to, to such cases? And uh, uh, Ms. Sabine uh, Vajant, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Pavel, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, and I'm very happy to be here. From my point of view, this is a very timely webinar because uh, it takes place at a moment when we have just concluded the public consultation on the anti-coercion instrument we are developing, um, and when we are fine-tuning the, the design of the measure, which we will propose uh, you said autumn, um, I would say, you know, it's getting closer to winter, uh, but still this year. Um, so um, I think the starting point is indeed, why do we need to consider this? And Jonathan has alluded to that. Uh, it's the new geoeconomic reality that we are facing uh, with an increasing number of players resorting uh, to coercion in order to achieve their uh, uh, aims. And they are not hesitating to weaponize trade relations in this context. Uh, let me also be clear when we started thinking about this, this was really under the impression of the Trump administration's use of 301 measures, uh, rather than uh, developments in China which are uh, more recent or have come to the forefront more recently. So it is quite clear that we have a lack of instruments here because we realized faced with uh, the threat of uh, 301 action by the Trump administration, that the only course of action would have been to go to the WTO, but that in a situation where we cannot afford to wait for 18 months uh, to have a first panel ruling. Um, so it, the, the lack of instruments is very clear. Now, uh, uh, let me make uh, 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 three uh, remarks in, in reply to your presentation. I'm happy to come in on a more detailed design after also having listened to the other speakers. I think the first thing I wanted to say is uh, we have to place this anti-coercion instrument against the backdrop of the overall EU policy to enforce to reinforce its resilience. And I think the report alludes to that. We have to look at where are our vulnerabilities and how can we also strengthen our resilience? What are the pressure points we have? So we should not look at the anti-coercion instrument in isolation. We have to look at it also against the backdrop of what we are doing in terms of analyzing and acting on certain strategic dependencies. And we've done a lot of analytical work between DG Trade and DG Grow in the context of the industrial uh, policy uh, uh, strategy that has come forward, where we are looking at where do we have, and there are very few cases, where do we really have vulnerabilities in terms of being dependent on one source of, uh, 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 of provision uh, to us. What, however, is also interesting in that context is to look at reverse dependencies. Where are others dependent on us? 
Um, and that is something uh, we are also looking at. Then you make a lot of very uh, important points uh, about the need to strengthen uh, the internal market. Uh, uh, I fully agree with that. And we also need to have diversification in our trade policy uh, as a, 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 a part of the toolbox uh, to strengthen our resilience. So it's in this context against the backdrop of open strategic autonomy that we are reflecting about an anti-coercion instrument. Um, because we remain, we remain uh, uh, very much dependent on an open, interconnected uh, world. Um, and uh, 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 this is something uh, where, which we depend on for our prosperity and the recovery after the pandemic, but also for geopolitical reasons if we want to shape global, global governance in this respect. So I think that was the first remark I wanted to make. The second is that, um, I mean, we are, the EU is not going to uh, uh, shoot from the hip. Yeah. Um, we are not the ones stepping out of international law. Uh, 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 we are reacting to where others are stepping out of international law. And therefore, I answer the question, do we need such an instrument with a clear yes? Uh, because we cannot watch on uh, as others weaponize trade. We need to be able uh, to respond. But against this, uh, the context I have, I have set out, in a way, if the instrument works, we will not have to use it. So this is an instrument you want to put into your shop window, uh, ideally never to have to use it. Um, and I think that is something that is very important. And that is why when we look at the design of the measure, we have to make sure that it is not an instrument for escalation, but for de-escalation. And that depends on the design uh, we will have to uh, develop here. Third point, uh, and I started with that, the public consultation has just been uh, concluded. We are looking at the different elements. And it is clear, that, and you have, Jonathan has already referred to many of the points we need to look at. The triggers, yeah? And here we have to be in line with international law. And that puts a certain um, uh, constraint on us in terms of tackling coercion vis-a-vis -vis private actors. It's not black and white, you know. Uh, from our point of view, we can build this on violation of state sovereignty by a coercive action that aims at changing government's behavior. But we can capture also, in, we, we are confident we can capture informal forms of uh, such pressure. Uh, or silent forms uh, of such pressure. Uh, so, but that is something we are currently looking at because uh, we need to make sure that this is legally solid uh, and, and functions. Uh, second design feature we need to look at is obviously the actions. And here we would be aiming for a very broad scope in theory so that we can tailor make the threat of action to the concrete action we are uh, counteracting. Uh, so uh, tariffs and trade curbs, yes, uh, investment, public procurement access. We are also looking at intellectual property. Uh, we have not looked at export controls because export controls are being carried out in a security logic. Yeah, and we are building, we are working also with others, but on the basis of uh, international regimes like Vassana, et cetera. So, you know, the export control for reasons of uh, 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 anti-coercion is something I have some hesitation about, but I'd be interested to hear what others have to say. And the third point, is, the third design element is the decision making, where, you know, there we need to strike the right balance between speed, which is important for credibility, and ownership by member states, by, by all the actors in the EU without allowing a third country to divide, to divide the EU in the design of the measures. So these are, uh, we also need to build into the decision-making a sort of a cooling off period, which would allow us to de-escalate. Uh, so, you know, you can also take a first step and then say to the third country concerned, let's sit down and talk about this because you can still avert these measures by the EU. So these are the, the, the three elements we are currently looking at, and I'm looking forward to the discussion and hoping I will get some ideas on how to fine tune our own reflection uh, inside the Commission and DigiTrade. Thank you. Thanks a lot, and I hope our, our paper will uh, prove uh, useful for that process too. Um, Mr. Carbilt, uh, 
we already read part of your uh, answer in your latest uh, piece for Project Syndicate, where you said that Biden is back, but America isn't. Uh, but still, uh, let me ask you the, the same question. Is the anti-coercion instrument the right response to Europe's current problems? It is unfortunately uh, one of the responses that are needed. Uh, I, would, uh, I would have wished that I would have said distinctly no to this particular question, uh, but I can't. What we've seen is different actors using economic coercion for quite some long time. I, I, I go back to what I've seen over the years of Russia, uh, primarily to the different countries in his neighborhood. You mentioned the recent example of beer versus Czech Republic. But I mean, if you talk to the Ukrainians or the Moldovans or the Latvians or the Lithuanians, the Georgians, it's been going on for decades back and forth. And I remember times when it's been frustrating in the EU that we had no instruments to do anything about it. It was not directed in this particular case against us, but it was directed against interests that we were defending as well. Uh, and, and Russia has always been, has also been using it in ways that have been somewhat difficult, because sometimes they have been doing things, so you say, Moldovan wines is uh, unhealthy. And the diplomats in Moscow know nothing about that because they don't take those sorts of decisions. They are hardly even informed. It's taken by some sort of sort of some sort of in, allegedly independent authority and uh, under provisions that are somewhat difficult to deal with. I'm just mentioning that to say that Russia has a long experience uh, to use this over a wide variety of different ways. Uh, the Americans, as been mentioned, not only Trump, has to be said in all honesty, um, economic instruments as part of uh, their policy arsenal has become increasingly important, primarily the weaponization of the dollar, uh, but also to some extent the weaponization of trade. Um, I think we have gone through a period that has been particularly difficult with Trump because we had a difficult period overall in the transatlantic relationship that is probably hopefully behind us. But I think the tendency in the US to use the financial and trade instruments that has not retweeted, that is still there. And then China. China has been using this for a long time, although we have not been affected. I mean, it's Japan, South Korea, uh, lately you have seen Australia, that is more recent addition. And they've also been using it in some sort of uh, Russian sort of ways. I mean, it's, uh, there's, it's a public, it's the public anger uh, of the Chinese people against HMM because some sort of statement. Uh, I mean, so we, we've had this for a long time. So sometimes they use the overt instruments and sometimes could covert or somewhat more difficult to deal with. This is the world in which we are in. And Europe must devise instrument. When that is done, I think a couple of remarks. First, I think we should, and here perhaps ECFR can, we, if I use that particular word, can use more. Um, we should publish somewhat more and encourage more studies on the effect of this, because my argument would be that in most cases where this has been used, it has been ineffective or counterproductive. Uh, there is the belief that economic coercion works. I, I, I think the empirical evidence is that it rarely works and is sometimes counterproductive. And have more of that up in the public, out in the public domain might act as sort of slightly discourage the use of that particular instrument. If that doesn't work, and this is a long-term thing, I would like to sort of emphasize the two aspects that Sabine mentioned as well. The aim of our instruments that we must have, in my opinion, are two. One is to deter. We don't want this to happen. Uh, we have an instrument in an open, rules-based, multilateral order. That's fairly obvious. But when others are doing these things, we must have an instrument to deter them, to say that if you do these things, nasty things might happen. And these nasty things are not good for you either. But if the deterrent effect fails, and it sometimes does, I think the aim was, was, must always be, as she mentioned as well, de-escalation. 
uh, that we immediately go, because sometimes when you see when, for example, we use sanctions in foreign policy, sometimes too much, in my opinion, sanctions sometimes tends to be more a substitute for policy than parts of policy, but that's a separate issue. Um, sometimes you just get stuck in a situation where you can't get out of it. Um, so you must have a flexibility in the instrument that makes it possible for you to go into a de-escalatory negotiating process. That leads, we must not be, we must not box in ourselves in an automatic response according to some sort of preset uh, rule book that deprives us of the flexibility that we need in order to de-escalate a given situation. And this calls for instruments that I think are flex strong, but flexible in their use and adaptable as well. Um, and I think I restrict myself to this. Necessary, absolutely, we're gonna face this. We need to also globally, perhaps pursue a debate to demonstrate to people that normally this is an instrument that doesn't really work. So abstain it from, they should abstain for that particular purpose. And, and then instruments uh, designed to deter and to de-escalate. Uh, with these principles, that's fairly easy said, then uh, not that easy to do, uh, but I think Jonathan and others in the team have done an excellent work in putting concrete ideas on paper on how it can be done. Thank you, Carl, and I'm happy because all of those principles are reflected in, in how Jonathan and I were, were thinking about the uh, instrument. Let, let me now uh, move, move to Miss uh, Noël Lenoir and ask you a, a similar question. Is this the, uh, is economic coercion the problem? And is, would, would an instrument like an anti-coercion instrument be a response? And, and it, I, I, let me underline that, that it's, it, it would be great to hear from you, not just from your ex experience as a politician, and uh, Minister for, for Europe, but, but also given your, your, your legal uh, experience as a lawyer. Uh, you need to uh, unmute yourself. Oh, I probably can try, but... Uh... Excuse me. So thanks very yes. much for the invitation and uh, to, to Jonathan and Pavel, and I'm very happy to be with uh, Sabine. Leon and uh, Minister Bilt, I'm sure that they have much more expertise than I have, but I can give uh, my, my experience as a lawyer and as a former minister. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, this uh, initiative is extremely timely because uh, from a French perspective, uh, we are very happy to see the union First of all, pronouncing the word industrial policy, uh, which is no longer an impolite expression. Second, to take care of the external world. Because I think that the real issue is no longer essentially the internal market, but the place of Europe in the world and how we can sustain our economy, that is to say, to defend our value. Uh, and it's very, very important. And I think that the principle of reciprocity, which the French are very keen of, is, is, is an international principle, and it's unbearable to accept the measures which are taken against states and against companies in Europe just before, because they, they, they discuss with people or they award a Nobel Prize to a dissident. I think that we cannot accept this as a political entity and not only as an economic entity. And uh, I must say that uh, in France, uh, we have many political problems as you, as, you, as you know, but one of the reasons of the disaffection to the European Union from citizens, it is its weakness. And uh, the press uh, uh, has been very, very tough with Europe with regard to uh, the conclusion of the contracts to get uh, as many vaccines as possible. I think it was unjust, but it shows that the citizens are told that Europe is, is weak. And what is uh, more important even is that now industrials, some of them, think exactly the same with some reasons. Because the Green Deal is formidable, because we, we want to, to, to serve 
you know, the interest of the planet and of the world and of the future generation. But industry has to live. And all what is done now is just to sanction industries, uh, legislation on transparency, legislation on uh, the duty of vigilance. I'm, I'm totally in favor of that. But I think that what is really new in the bad and the good uh, sense, I must say, is that the industries, first of all, they are much less feared by retaliation measures if some coercion measures are taken to retaliate against boycott of their products, for instance, if it is at the level of the union, of a united union, and it's clear that, for instance, the auto industry in, in Germany, which is very vulnerable because of the investment in, in China, has changed. Uh, Sabine, perhaps you know better than I do, but have changed. They didn't want anything to be done, and now they have changed. They think that they have to be protected by the EU. And I think that the real challenge of what you are doing is to show that the European Union is able to protect its citizens and also its economic operators. And it's time to show it because it's not obvious at all at the present time. The second point for me is that because we are a less strong power that we should be because of political reasons, not at all of economic reasons, but it's very difficult to manage a country. So it's very difficult to manage 27 states. I agree very, I agree, of course, I'm aware of that. But the weaknesses is that we haven't done what is absolutely indispensable in this respect, lesson learned. Why is it that all the tools that we have to protect our economic interests do not work? First of all, the dispute settlement mechanism at the WTO. Well, it doesn't work now because of President Trump uh, blockage of the, of the appellate body, but also it doesn't work because it's too long. You know, the timing of the industry is not the timing of the administration. I don't know how to do, but we cannot accept that the, 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 the countries which bre breach, infringe international rules of the WTO have before them two years, three years, four years, five years to continue without being sanctioned. So I think that uh, it's, it's really an issue. The dispute settlement mechanism is good in itself, but it's much too long. When I see arbitration, it, it has not to, to, to last, uh, you know, years and years to be efficient. The second lesson learned has to do with anti-dumping measures. And of course, uh, we respect the rule of law, but the proof that the commission has to bring to show that the prices are not uh, uh, it's linked to dumping and because etc uh, etc et you know it diminishes greatly the efficiency of the measures and i would take would like to take one example about the photovoltaic industry which was almost killed by the chinese why is it uh, the americans at the time of obama were quite reactive resilient they, they oppose a tariff of 40% uh, of uh, anti-tariffs. Uh, we were very more modest because the German industry didn't want, I, I understand, didn't want to, to be too tough with the Chinese. But the result is that it was inefficient. And imagine if the Chinese take measures of that kind to kill our industry in the battery sector because the Green Deal is a big project, but the Green Deal deals with sectors where the Chinese are much more in advance than Europe. So if you want it to be credible, you have to do something to deter the Chinese to kill this industry. And they have benefited a lot of the crisis, of the economic crisis due to the pandemic, because their, their, their growth was not so impacted and uh, the export uh, of, of Chinese product uh, well illustrated our dependence uh, even in the medical sector, which is incredible. So I think that uh, there is a waking uh, call, up call, 
uh, which and there is an emergency to have new instruments. And I will uh, finish before to take a few seconds of the measures with the uh, free trade agreement. I'm personally very proud to see the expertise of uh, the EU with regard to bilateralism and to free trade agreements. They are more sophisticated now than they were and almost all regions of the world except Russia or other regions uh, for political reasons are covered by these agreements. But these agreements must have teeth. And as a lawyer, having uh, worked with companies which were faced with uh, discriminatory uh, domestic regulations, not in China, I won't go to the country, in another country, they were surprised to see that at the occasion of the meeting, annual meeting between the two parties, the EU and the representatives of the other country, nothing had been done and the subject matter had even not been evoked. So I think that if you want to give more credibility to these agreements, which are really an asset for Europe, there is a need to give teeth to these agreements because reciprocity is the first and basic principle of international law. And of course, I, I'm, I'm aware that relations of force uh, prevail sometimes, but we have, as, as the community of law, based on the rule of law in Europe, we have to be respected. And I'm afraid that if we don't take measures, we won't be. So with regard to the measures, yep. I have no expertise. I think that first of all, they must be as diverse as possible. And as Sabine said, tailor-made, because we have not to limit ourselves, first of all. And I'm even more interested at the way they will be triggered in due time than in the measures themselves. Because I think that the measures they are a way to say to the country, we want you to go back to negotiation because trade war is not an issue, is not a, an aim, it's not a goal. So we have to see our strengths and to say to them, we, we are open, our door is open, but we can take this measure. And of course, activation of the mechanism is very difficult when you have so many divergent interests. And I must say, uh, the, the road of the silk, which is somewhere in Europe, not everywhere, is really an issue. And that's why I think it is really, really urgent that the ACI is uh, a concrete initiative instead of being discussed during years and years and years. And I would propose, before to put these measures in place, to create this uh, office of European Office of uh, Economic Resilience as a kind of center of monitoring of what is done and what our strengths and weaknesses, because it will, before to have this mechanism, which will uh, require, uh, even if it's not una a unanimity, uh, uh, a qualified majority, I think it is very urgent to have this cooperative body where the, the different countries uh, can discuss and, 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 and work together so to take the most appropriate measure to defend our European interests, that is to say, our values. Because if we are economically weak, we will not be able to defend democracy. And I'm not sure that the future generation we live in a democracy, even in Europe, if we are not economically strong. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just to say that uh, the resilience office, this idea is also in the paper that we published uh, today. We believe that this this should be part of the whole ecosystem of things that, that, that are needed in order to provide resilience. Um, uh, we are uh, in the middle of our discussion, and uh, I, I would like to ask the audience also to to put your questions in the Q&A chat. Uh, um, and before I, I, I go to those questions, let me uh, still uh, ask one more question to, to Miss uh, Sabine Viant and to Carl uh, Bild. And uh, uh, the first question to, to Miss Viant is, is about uh, countermeasures. Uh, so where, how to des design 
credible but also effective countermeasures. You, you said that you would like to have a wide scope, but at which concrete countermeasures you are looking in particular as the, uh, as the most promising ones? Um, well, I'm also tempted to react to Noël Lenoir, yeah, but please your intervention, do so. of course, went a lot beyond the uh, question of the anti-coercion instrument here mm -hmm. uh, and raised a lot of issues of which would merit another seminar, I would suggest, <laughs> especially on our free trade agreements having T's or no T's. Uh, I think we are, with the Chief Trade Enforcement Officer, stepping up our action because it's not a question of the agreements having T's. It's a question of having the resources to follow up and to hold everyone to the commitments they've made. And I think we have a lot to show already uh, in terms of uh, enforcing what we have negotiated. And let me also uh, make one remark where I really disagree with you. I think the issue of the photovoltaic industry is the typical issue we face when we look at anti-subsidy, anti-dumping action. And that is you look at the producers of the product, in this case, solar panels, uh, uh, and you look at those who actually use them. And in this case, given our targets on renewable uh, industry, there were many who were interested in having cheap imports from China. So uh, it was not a question of the tools and we certainly cannot lay this at the door of the WTO or at the door of our own procedures. This is simple, um, simply a matter of uh, adjudicating between different interests. Uh, whether that's within a country or within a continent, I think that is the challenge uh, we, we face here. But where we take these actions, they prove to be extremely uh, effective. Uh, if I look at steel and China, I think we have nothing to be ashamed of on the contrary. But to come back to your question, Pavel, <laughs> um, on the issue uh, of the instruments, I think we are looking at all the issues that you are, in terms of the measures, we are looking at all the things you identify Plus, I think one element I already briefly mentioned is also uh, intellectual property. Uh, that is something we are looking at. Um, where we are a bit skeptical, but, well, I'm not excluding reflections on this, is on export controls, because it would be a change of logic in the export control regime as we are operating it now. Then there and is procurements. another- Procurements? Sorry? Sorry? What and about public, public? And public procurement. That is indeed something we are looking at as well. Uh, so from that point of view, we think that with that, we would have a panoply of different instruments, which we could then, uh, where the, the use or the threat could be tailor-made to the action uh, we are targeting. At the same time, and I think this will also come up in the discussion if I look at the, at the comments, um, there are also other actions we need to take outside uh, the trade field in terms of the resilience. And I think you mentioned, or Carl Bild mentioned, also the, the weaponization of the dollar. So I think it is extremely important that we uh, uh, become serious about the international use of the Euro. And I think we also have to look uh, at the issue of the blocking statute, uh, which is linked to what we are doing here, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, so I'm sure we will come back in the quest, uh, on the questions. But so we are looking as broad as possible and we will have to discuss with the member states uh, what exactly are uh, the measures they would be willing to consider and to put into the toolbox. Then we would still have a discussion uh, when we come to a concrete case, what is the most appropriate instrument in a given case to deter uh, coercion? Thanks a lot. I will quickly go to Carl and ask, uh, not, ju you, not, not just as a former prime minister and former foreign minister, but also as a Swede, aren't you, when you listen to all of it, aren't you too afraid about the protectionist threat, which looms in, in all of the, those discussions? Or what, what are the risks that you see in, uh, in the anti coercion instrument? And I have to unmute you uh, or ask you to unmute. Uh, no, as, as a Swede or as a, as a true European, uh, because Europeans are by tradition always free trader. That's why. I mean, why did Europe gain global ascendancy 200 years ago? It was because we traded with the world. Others were protectionists, we were free traders. And then we went from a world dominated by the protectionist Indians and Chinese to the free trading Europeans. I'm, I'm a Swede and an I'm European. So that more, more an ideological, <laughs> historical comment to the thing. No, as I said at the beginning, I, I would have wished this discussion didn't occur. 
that, that this is completely unnecessary. Uh, but we, 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 we can't disassociate yourself from the world as it is. But that's also why I underline the fact that I think we need to more, do more studies to demonstrate that normally these instruments don't work. As a matter of fact, I, I know very few examples of it having worked. I mean, the, the Chinese have used it against Japan and South Korea. Uh, they could do a slight adjustment of something. It was mentioned the example of the Chinese against Norwegians. What did that produce? Nothing. Uh, the Russian, all of the instruments I've used, basically counterproductive. These countries are now, close, are now more far away from Russia than they ever have been. Um, so that's also part of the deterrent that is there. Two more specific comments. One, uh, as I've been mentioned in the... Um, uh, inventory that have been done by the commission that you've also looked at the sort of the reverse dependency, so to say. Um, not only where we are dependent upon the outside world, but where the outside world is dependent upon us. Not very many examples that I can think of at the moment, but it's important to have them on the table, although that being seen, of course, the question, as you mentioned, of export controls. And uh, these issues are not necessarily always in the hands of the commission, not only sometimes not only in the hands of, not even of the member states, but, but clearly it needs to be part of what we look at. And when we look at them, that becomes something that the other countries are aware of and, and has, has an indirect effect in itself. Then you stress again, we need to have a very wide array of measures on the table so that we have sort of an escalatory ladder potentially, but at the same time, be very careful not to box ourselves in, into some sort of automaticity. Uh, we don't want to create a trade equivalent of the summer of 1914, where you suddenly have the one step after the other leading to something that no one really wanted at the beginning of that particular conflict. So these are just considerations that needs to be taken in, 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 into account. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, I will now read a couple of questions from the audience so that you can all prepare uh, and choose from it uh, in your in your final final remarks. Uh, um, and th those questions are, for example, are, for from, example from Henry, Henry uh, Farrell uh, saying that uh, there is an argument that exposed flexibility can damage ex ante credibility, which means that if people know that uh, they can negotiate their punishment after the fact, it may make them more willing to do bad things in the first play, place. So does the EU face a fundamental credibility trade-off if it tries to adopt a more flexible instrument? Or are there ways in which it can overcome this problem? Then there is also a question about the legal basis from Antonius de Vries asking what would probably be the legal basis of of a potential anti-coercion instrument, and would Article 207 of the Treaty uh, of the EU treaties suffice in the light of the ECJ Singapore uh, ruling? And then uh, there is also a question ab uh, about, about uh, EU private companies. Why would it be problematic for the uh, um, anti-coercion instrument to also work in those cases uh, where Europe would try to shield? companies from, from economic coercion. So before I give you uh, the floor for final remarks, let me all come back to my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, and ask you to comment on, on what you have uh, heard, but probably also tell us a little bit, tell others a little bit of what we were thinking about when we talked about the escalation mechanism and uh, about the use of export controls uh, as, as one of possible countermeasures. All right now, now I should be online again. Um, uh, yes, I think I think some of those questions um, uh, should go to the panelists um, uh, for sure, um, uh, just to give them a lot of uh, space. But um, uh, but since since uh, both the de-escalatory nature of the instrument um, and and export controls have been have been a topic of this of this com conversation, I um, I, I can just uh, as Pavel said say take a few take a minute. To explain what how this figured uh, in our thinking based on the task force process that we've that we've engaged with in the last six months, um, and uh, uh, first of all, what we basically say in the in the report in the end is actually what the EU 
needs is not necessarily, and this is more about semantics, but it's very important what's behind it. Um, uh, not an anti-corrosion instrument, but a depoliticization politicization, uh, instrument. So, and, and from our point of view, that's probably what, um, uh, what is meant. But uh, so this instrument, as um, uh, the panelists have said, needs to have a focus on de-escalation where others escalate and where others politicize trade relations. This is something where, where we just need to be on an eye level in order to incentivize dialogue rather than, um, rather than having an open vulnerability and therefore making it easy to politicize trade. Uh, and, and probably there are, there are many different points or, or several in any case that we mentioned on what, what might be important to make that uh, happen and to make sure that that's the case. But um, probably one of them that if we look at sanctions policy more, more in general, always is a problem um, for, for various states um, uh, is lifting countermeasures or lifting the sanctions quickly, easily, probably more easily. We probably need a decision-making process that's easier than imposing them. Because oftentimes, uh, Carl has mentioned it, um, sanctions get used and we're not talking here about sanctions policy, but it's the same logic. Oftentimes sanctions get used, they get imposed, and then they stay on forever. And that's when they, and, and they will, the countermeasures of the anti-corrosion instrument will be effective if there's a very realistic, quick way of lifting them once uh, economic coercion has ceased, or once, uh, once there is a good dialogue and, and, this, and, and the, the difficult instance, uh, political instance is, is gone. So probably a much easier decision-making process to take them away than imposing them. And, um, and uh, 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 the point about export controls is really something that we came across um, again and again, thinking about how, how effective have, um, have tariff and trade measures really been in recent years and um, uh, from others, not Europeans. And, um, and, uh, and also the fact that, if, that, of course, and I don't have to explain this to anyone, um, that uh, trade measures can come with significant cost on uh, Europeans and European companies themselves. So uh, surgical, if there was a way of making export controls as, just as part of the menu as a surgical way of withholding a certain product that's not easily replaceable for, for a third country, that it is, that is very important for it, um, then we can also probably treat the question of compensation that's in the Q&A uh, section as well, because for this one product that we're withholding, probably we can even um, think about compens compensation. And, um, and that can be both effective and, well, possibly, possibly somewhat cr uh, credible. But um, uh, we would probably argue in favor of having this as part of the, part of the menu and, and mix um, uh, uh, because it's surgical, because it can be very effective and, um, and uh, can play exactly on, on um, some of the, the on, can be based on a thorough and vulnerability assessment of third countries. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, we are fortunately need to wrap up, wrap up, wrap up here. Yes, ex can exactly. I, so I, yes, I, I will give you the floor right right now. Uh, but can just I say just a word uh, about uh, what Jonathan has said about the industry, uh, where there can be a divergence between the government or the union and the industry, because they don't want to be impacted by the anti-corruption measures. I think that the Office of uh, European uh, Economic Resilience should be a place where the industry can go and instead of only their government and be listened to by these uh, people. Uh, I think that at the Commission level, that would be perfect with uh, representatives of states uh, to be consulted, but uh, the, the tool could be created inside the Commission. I think that it would be very interested to allow the industrials to have their say at this level and the Bureau of Resilience can have a, a, another view of the different uh, forces in, uh, you know, uh, which has to be taken account in the uh, decision making of the resilient uh, measures. I think that the industry must be uh, consulted. Yeah, thanks a lot. And it's reassuring because uh, Jonathan and I are also discussing other things in which uh, where is to, to strengthen Europe's 
economic resilience, one of them being resilience office, another being a possible reform of the blocking statute. So, so this is important to keep, to understand all of this as, as part of a, of a larger uh, picture. We need to wrap up. I, I need to give one minute to each of you, which is not much, to try to respond to some of the questions that I mentioned, but also hopefully you could, uh, in, in a couple of words, just, just tell me in your opinion, what's one key point that for commission and core legislators to keep in mind when they discuss and design uh, an anti-coercion instrument uh, later this year, starting with uh, Sabine Veyan. No, thank you very much. Uh, and I think there's a rich debate uh, to which we cannot uh, unfortunately respond now uh, with lots of the questions in the, in the chat. Um, I think we need to look at the issue of uh, financial compensation for business. Um, this is an open question. Uh, we are still studying. Um, stakeholders in the public uh, consultation reacted differently to that. Um, and I think it makes, I mean, I see the advantage because it breaks the link uh, between the companies who will then not exert pressure on the government to cede to coercion. But on, on the other hand, you also have a moral hazard issue which you need to look at. So it's not, you know, it's not that easy to design. So for instance, if you have a, a company which invests uh, in, a, uh, in an area where there is forced labor, and then you have due diligence obligations, and then a government reacts, uh, a third country government reacts with sanctions, uh, are you going to uh, protect uh, 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 that company and compensate them uh, for no longer being able to benefit from forced labor because they have to withdraw from a certain area? That's just to illustrate that this issue is very complex. But we are, we are looking at this issue. On the resilience office, um, I mean, in a way, this is probably the work of three quarters of the commission at this stage. So whether this is from energy to uh, transport, uh, to uh, internal markets, uh, connect, grow, trade, etc. What we need are effective structures to pull that together and indeed to also not only work with the member states for that we have structures, but also with the industry. Whether a new administrative structure is the best way to do that, where then basically you have to pull together three quarters of the commission. Um, I'm not so convinced about that, but we need to have effective uh, uh, mechanisms here. And the third point is on this issue of uh, the decision making, which is important for the credibility. I think you're underestimating uh, the experience we already have and the flexible means we have. And we have used those, for instance, we could very quickly lift the sanctions uh, 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 on, on Boeing uh, when the Americans agreed to suspend them on Airbus. Yeah, so in, in that so we have a lot of experience with tailor-made flexible mechanisms. Um, and I think we have to design a system where, for instance, you could also imagine that you introduce the measure, but you say they will kick in in two months' time if we do not uh, put an end to the coercion. Or you have you introduce the measures and you have a review and say we can remove remove them after three months. I mean, I'm, I'm inventing the three months now, but what I'm saying is we have the tools. We will have to agree with the member states how to strike the right balance between, as I said, ownership, political ownership of the measures taken and the speed with which uh, measures can be taken. And probably we will have to have more than one decision-making mode in this instrument in order to cater for different situations. Because sometimes speed may be absolutely of the essence. Sometimes you can allow yourself to take a few more weeks in order to build the consensus inside the EU, which may not be given from the outset. So a lot of work ahead of Super us. Super interesting. But thank you, but thank you very much for the contribution and looking forward to reading uh, the report in detail. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, and I'm moving to Carl Bild. What's one thing to remember when, when the discussions about uh, uh, the anti-coercion instrument gather momentum in Europe in the, in the months to come? And I need to ask you to unmute again. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Uh, two things. Uh, interesting uh, exchange of views on the decision-making mechanism. Just to underline my experience from foreign policy that sanctions, and there are similarities, sanctions are of use uh, w before they are imposed, because then you can sort of impact upon the sort of the action of your adversary. 
and when you are prepared to lift them, because then you can also exert some sort of price. In the meantime, bloody useless. Uh, you need to have them there, but it's those two. And, and, and that's also important. Sabine mentioned the time element. One can decide on a measure that's going to happen X numbers of days, weeks down the line. That's more effective than if you do it immediately. That, that's just a reflection. Otherwise, it was to take, take into account, well, as we said here, we have to be very careful. Uh, we are here to devise an instrument that is designed not to be used. Uh, because it's designed to deter others from doing the things that would cause us to do the things that we don't want to do. I and mean, that's not an entirely easy equation. But if you have that equation at the forefront of the process, I think we'll end up with something that is quite useful. Thanks, Alain. Thanks, Alain. Noël Lenoir, what's and one thing to remember? Point, to remember? It's, not, it's not a confusion, it's just three different points. First of all, uh, I think that it's very important to and I'm happy that it was evoked by Sabine Bayon uh, to think about uh, IP and the uh, protection of transfer of technology. Uh, it's extremely important. I was, I saw that at EU level, there was a regulation forbidding offsets, but it doesn't work at all and it's never sanctioned. And I think that because uh, Europe is based on innovation, uh, it's, it's for us, the question of survival. So first thing, transfer technology and your mechanism. The second point is access to procurement or to public procurement. I think that there are examples where the Chinese have, uh, because their prices were much lower, they have had uh, uh, the possibility to, to, to be uh, uh, tenderers and to, to, to be retained by uh, Poland, for instance, to build roads and in fact, uh, they had not means. So the silk uh, road and uh, access to public procurement, I think that uh, it's very important. I have nothing against the Chinese as such, but I think that they are, you know, conquering Europe and Africa in a very, very efficient way at the present moment. And uh, we must have a global vision of the world rather to be focused only as European on technical measures. And third point, I would like to see the ACI, but I, I speak on my behalf. I'm not uh, representing the government or any, it's my personal viewpoint. <laughs> I would like the ACI to be an experimental laboratory to introduce in each free trade agreement, a mechanism of sanction and an efficient one. Uh, I think that of course we don't want people to be bad with us or unfriendly, but it happens, it can happen, and we must have strength because I believe in law, but because I believe in law, I know that law is efficient when we have strength. So I would like Europe to have both. And I wish that the future generation, because Europe is an extraordinary project, and I wish that the future generation will be proud of what we have done and our ancestors have done. So we must be stronger. And as was said by uh, Thierry Breton and uh, Margaret Bastegger, uh, it's time not to be any longer naive. We are adults. We know that the world is not specifically kind. The world is as it is. We are part of it and we have to defend our industries, our economic interests, that is to say our democracies. Thanks a lot. So Europe is growing up. Jonathan, <laughs> what's your one point to remember? Uh, I think um, uh, depolitization is, as, as we've mentioned, uh, that this instrument is, is not something where Europe is politicizing trade relations, but it's something that where we react. Thanks a lot. And we are already five minutes uh, beyond the schedule. So let me just thank all of you, the, the audience and the speakers. I hope everyone has enjoyed this discussion. I encourage all of you to have a read look at, at the policy brief that, that we have published today at, at UC, UCFR's website. Let me also use this opportunity to thank our wonderful UCFR colleagues for making both this event and the publication possible. And a special thanks goes to 
Philip Medunich, Clara, Sophie Kramer, Andreas Bock, Amanda Bock, Adam Harris, Marlene Reeder, and uh, Suzanne Baumann. I think I have forgotten about some of my colleagues, but uh, it's already too, too little time now. It's time to go and watch your football, and I wish you all a good rest of the day. Thanks a lot. <laughs>